well known as the lady who, who cuddles with sharks. And some says that in addition to human language, she can speak shark language too. Now you might have an idea on our guest speaker. She is none other than our pride ocean girl, Christina Zanato. Christina, we are glad to welcome you to this program. Uh, good, good morning, morning Christina. How are you today? Good, thank you. Sorry if you had to wake up early because of us. Oh, we're um, it's my normal time. <laughs> oh, great. Um, without wasting your valuable time, um, I'll move to the first question. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what's so interesting about sharks? What inspired you to study them and protect them? Um, because, um, and I grew up into what would be called the Jaws generation. So there were all these movies depicting the negative side of sharks. But as a child, I actually had the opportunity to see this movie that was maybe a little bit tacky, but it actually had a, a guy who had sharks for friends. And we use the sharks to attack people who were unfriendly, able to have sharks for friends. And I come from the ocean. My family was always in the ocean. So I was always in the water. And my dad always taught me there are no monsters in the sea, only the, wind, the ones you make up in your head. And uh, the combination of the two made me desire to want to learn about sharks. But between the seven, eight year old, two year old, let's say a little bit more adult person, who can put me into studying languages are allowing me to have this job to then continue working with sharks. So my fascination comes really from, from childhood. Like I think from most of us, when we're exposed to something positive, it really inspires something to want to, to join and connect. And I think that was my spark. Thank you. Um, as you said, in movies, sharks are ferocious, bloodthirsty creatures. But how true is this? And what are the other famous misconceptions about sharks? Very good question. So uh, there, it's not true. Uh, sharks are fish. And so as a fish, they behave like all the other fish in the ocean. Uh, they, of course, are some of them what we call apex predators, so on the top of the food chain. But some of them are mesopredators, so they fit in the middle of the chain. Uh, and as predators, of course, they have this role of eliminating other animals. There's no eating. However, between... Um, So the difference is we have, have sharks this time. Um, I think that not only the rest of these animals, so we always see about tigers, great amber heads, so forget all the other 516 species of sharks that uh, basically uh, live in our ocean but in a way very damaging uh, for their images other misconception about sharks is that people are convinced as soon as you hit the water the sharks will be there to eat you or to bite you well there's millions and millions of people that go in the water daily all over the world if that if that was true if it was true the sharks were eating literally eating feeding on humans there will be no water activities zero we would never be able to hit anything. So do negative encounters happen? Yes. Are they the norm? No, they're extremely, extremely rare. Um, and then we have all the physical, I guess, misconceptions about sharks. And we could go into the entire biology part of like how from uh, I all sharks always have to primarily 90% of the species have a system called buccal pumping. So a lot of sharks are 
open and close in their mouth. So, um, get sick, and it's like that's not true. They actually become sick. I, I actually uh, over the years, so we go into the myths. Oh well, if I take shark cartilage, shark cartilage is going to heal all my problems. And just kind of like, no, you're actually ingesting quite a lot of mercury because sharks being on the top of the food chain actually collect quite a lot of that. And so, like lots of the big animals out there, tuna, uh, sailfish, the swordfish, sharks, they have lost that positive. You know, I remember growing for, for you. And nowadays, you have to look at it and thinking, I'm not sure it's that good for me anymore. So, um, out of the 522 species, which one is your favorite? Why, why you like <laughs> Arabian reef shark? The sharks that I work with is obviously my favorite because I have other one. And for beauty and for, um, I would say, beauty as well, that are I think the blue shark are like mildly cooler water. Um, we're talking about they live more up the north coast of uh, Florida, California, uh, sorry, Florida, uh, United States. Uh, you're talking about Maine, uh, Rhode Island, uh, those places, as well as California. So we're looking like a cooler water. And they're just absolutely a very different sharks than the Caribbean. It's a pelagic shark, so it's an open water shark. It's absolutely fluorescent blue, very slender, very elegant, very inquisitive, very, very inquisitive. So those are my two favorite uh, species. But then I'm attracted to, to the small ones. You know, I try to, to in, in inspire people with like looking up sharks, you know, like the epaulette shark that can actually walk. So come come out of the water and kind of like waddle through the puddles and actually walk on the pectoral fins or like the cookie cutter. The first time I heard the story about the cookie cutter, very, every once in a while they will come in with just like a round circle. Missing out of the figure it out, it was actually a shark called the cookie cutter, specifically because or a dolphin, and literally chunks out a piece of the flesh the size of a cookie. So these just voracious little suckers and teeth chunks out this little piece, and if millions and millions and millions of dollars of equipment because of this tiny shark chunking. There's there's quite a lot of, of interesting animals out there to really take a risk. So, so. As you already mentioned, shall they in our water? One is obviously the predators, the great white doesn't hunt on the biggest of their prey. So, not go after the slowest, uh, for example, infants or, or elderly that can't keep up anymore. So, they actually uh, clean out what is that is not healthy in the world, uh, an environment as well. As, as well as they basically through that method avoid the, the, the sick individuals and avoid actually in a certain way what we would consider a pandemic. But then the presence of predators, uh, mesopredators, apex predators, also helps into the redistributions of prey. We've seen that in very much on land. So where there's a very, very Located uh, behavior and, and destroying everything. So it's really 
distribution of the extent of the damage that will happen is, I think, really unknown. We can I would not want to be here the day we say we have lost our planet and on the health of the ocean. So they are really important. They are often killed for things to make things sure. Wasteful so, so, the fishermen and the sharks, they don't care about the sharks, they let them on heck die till this. And the other one is they're taking fish away from the sharks themselves. So now they're reducing the entire food um, ecosystem for all the animals. So, so that is industrial fishing very much. I would say also sport fishing. I know sport fishing in a certain way is a small one, but unfortunately, sport fishing, and that again is a Western world. Uh, kind of like habit is the targets the biggest so they go for the trophy hunting the biggest biggest are the best reproductive biggest animals you should actually leave those then we have the general pollution um, thermal pollution I would just sharks reproduce based on water temperature. The water temperature is if the oceans are growing slowly. I read there that one Celsius degree warmer than average. And it doesn't sound like much when it's distributed across the planet, the surface of the earth. It's very, very uh, high right imagine actually warming up the entire oceans by one degree celsius so now what's going to happen of uh, um the coastal development so a lot of sharks reproduce within our coastal areas there are sharks that need mangroves bays river estuaries and as humans in our let's say in our 
evolved state, uh, we actually have expanded to every piece of coastline that we had available. I mean, if you come to Italy, up to 200 years ago, all the villages were huddled up on the top of the hill, right? Because if you went down to the coast, there was the Saxons, there was the Mormon, the, Nor the, the Moroccans, there was the Africans, everybody, there was the Austrians, everybody came in to conquer us. And so we're all huddled up on the, on the top of the hill. But as a peace came through, as people became more comfortable with each other, um, you don't, you're not afraid of a pirate landing on the edge of this island. Everybody kind of like spread it out into the coastline. And so we're taking away the places where they can actually reproduce and keep their babies. So we definitely have quite a lot to deal with to kind of like consider the conservation, not only of sharks, obviously, but also of other marine animals. Um, based on your expertise, what are the cutting edge tools and practices in shark conservation? Well, um, I think the number one, and I know that it maybe it sounds very cliche, but it is education. It is understanding what is our relationship with them, but also what is that we are doing that obviously it needs a change and needs a modification in our in our attitude and obviously at my level i don't have the whole answers but it really requires a drastic change of attitude for uh, those who are above us and I, I say this like very clearly we are I, I live in the bahamas uh, we have sunlight 400 days a year <laughs> and uh, and yet we have laws that prevent the local citizens from producing more than 30 percent of their power through solar panels and i'm not saying solar panels are the 100 percent of solution but it's like while we're burning still carbon fuel, fossil fuels, to produce energy in a country where we have uh, wind power, where we have solar power, and we have a movement, tidal powers from the movement of the water in between islands and keys. So I think the first thing is a, a drastic change in our priorities into this uh, earning, give me, I need to have kind of world. And think about what would I need to do in order to give back so that we can continue living in this uh, in this manner. But then there's the individual, right? The individual we always think, well, these are huge problems. I will never be able to change the laws in the Bahamas for the solar panels. Like, maybe not. However, uh, the oceans are made of drops. And so for all of us as individuals start acting uh, within one goal, then that individual actually be everything that we need to do is a problems individually and then eventually you will find together to say solve the same problem how are we going to do that that's how we for example in government, we linked our arms and we said these are the reasons why there's a full conservation module for sharks about the finning, just a stop in finning, our one step, stop finning still does not stop the demise of sharks. And that's where I'm bringing it into the Bahamian uh, law is very comprehensive because you can say, well, you can fish sharks with the fins are still attached. And yes, it reduces a little bit the catch because obviously instead of having a deck full of fins, you, have a, you also have to have the carcass of the body. But let's not forget how sharks reproduce. Sharks were designed by nature to reproduce extremely slowly with very small litters of very late sexual maturity. So you're putting in all these factors, these animals are not designed to support the pressure that we put on them through our bycatch, through our fishing, even through our fishing by keeping the fins on. So shark finning laws are one step in a kilometer. This, the laws need to look into the whole picture. And like, for example, in the Bahamas, you cannot even land one dead shark. So if you accidentally you're out there fishing and you kill a shark, you'll have to release the shark into the water. And a lot of people think, but that's wasteful. It's like, in a way, in a different culture, it would be wasteful. 
I've been in certain parts of the world where I've seen the sharks on the market, where everybody eats every single piece of the shark. But in another way, it prevents the, oh, oopsie, today I accidentally killed 15 sharks, which is not really accidental, but they can say, well, I accidentally killed 15 sharks, these are my 15 sharks. So if you are not supposed to even show up with a shark on the deck, it prevents the then accidental, which is not really accidental killing, if that's Yes, thank you. Um, what are the most fascinating behaviors of sharks you have witnessed? Now, we know, like you. So, um, well, the, I think one of the best ones is, uh, is you know, silence of loner hunters. Um, they actually have aggregated together a lot of them have schooling. Uh, acceptance, they have hierarchies that you can actually notice in their interactions. So you can, and it's, it's actually really funny. I, I really don't want, like to compare sharks to other animals, but they have the same similar behavior to my dogs. When uh, my new third dog, who was a puppy, came in, the older dog, who is a seven, at a certain point, when it will become annoyed by the by the puppy's behavior, it will turn around and snarl, right? It wouldn't hit the puppy or anybody be kind of like, ah! you know just like enough and i watch my biggest girls my oldest girls do that with some of the smaller sharks when they become increasingly annoying or in the way they'll come in and just give them a little kind of like snap out of the way i am higher than you and so they have hierarchies um same as the trust that they can, they can put in me i mean uh, to me that is fascinating how an animal like that the sharks all over the world are actually very comfortable with us humans and they can actually understand the difference between a threat and actually a, uh, a safe interactions or a safe swimming together and they're very capable of discerning the two um, um, um we have like famous sharks like when 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 we hear the word shark it's always like great white slave sharks hammerheads that comes to our mind but we even have sharks living in fresh water. This is time for you to like enlighten us about those unusual or uncommon shark species. Oh, where do I start? <laughs> I mean, there are sharks. One of the things I always encourage, and I learned this in my culture, is sometimes in our culture, we have sharks that are not even named sharks. So I remember as I was growing up, I used to eat fish and my mom used to bring home the fish without the bones. And then I realized it was like a, a kind of a species of Mediterranean shark, but the local name was something, it, it didn't even sound shark. So in, in Italian, squalo is a shark, but she brought home palombo. I mean, palombo and squalo have no sound, no similarities whatsoever. So one of the things I encourage people is like, what are you putting on your plate? And actually figuring out what are the, you know, traditional names that we hear from our grandma or our mom or from our, the, the fisherman and what is the shark, angel shark. It looks more like a mix between a fish and a rat, uh, which I long nose with all those marbles dwellers. Some of, like I said, the lantern shark, the spiny dogfish, the, um, I already mentioned the cookie cushion of Port Jackson. Um, they actually don't even have teeth. They have like crashing palates and kind of like two little curls into the, their front face. It looks like they have two giant mustache, you know, create like the Austrians used to do. Um, you have the Wobbegong. The Wobbegong is an out of flat shark that has all sorts of appendages and blends into his own environment and then is an ambush hunter. So you start looking all these different species and they don't even look like your traditional sharks, shaped sharks. So some, some of those ones that I think uh, people can look at well who's the other one that is extremely cute um a quality for me is the goblin shark which is completely stark white with this ex extended nose and all this you know like 
um, very uh, ragged teeth. It looks like very vicious, but they actually their teeth are designed to trap like squishy, squishy prey. So they're more like of a cage trap. And so, um, and you can start Googling, you know, sharks of the world or sharks of uh, uh, around Sri Lanka. And you'll be very surprised actually on the shape and size of the animals that you have there. People call you the lady who comes with sharks. And in videos, we have seen you with sharks, especially um, you helping um, them by removing fishing hooks. And everyone likes to be like you, get hands on experience in shark conservation. It is similar conservation work like you do. And what citizen style opportunity to get engaged in shark conservation? Well, well so I started removing hooks from the sharks that I know and work with. Simply the same way I want to remove a thorn out of my dog's paw. So the swollen joes are having issues. And I was like, well, I'm going to help shark. Try to remove hooks from sharks they're not familiar with without the proper protective equipment, without really not knowing uh, what they're doing. Removing hooks that way may hurt the shark, but may as well hurt the person who's trying to do that. So um, removing hooks has become more of a symbol. Is like how to hook people to want to protect sharks. So how can we protect sharks? I think comes more from becoming uh, what you're doing right now. So an educational program, understanding a little bit more, and then become more involved in our local environment. What are the laws there? You know, how are, uh, what do the fishermen know? Can we approach the fishermen and go out with them and understand how they live, why they're doing this? And for example, how can we educate them better? How can we also, because Saint saying, you know, oh, you need to stop fishing. It's just like, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> good luck with that. And first, I'm from an island nation. The Bahamas is an island nation. Try to tell the people that live on an island that they shouldn't fish anymore. But there's ways that we can change that. And there's ways in which, for example, shark tourism has helped reducing the amount of people that are going out there fishing. Because all of a sudden they have a renewable form of entry, which is well, I don't make $1,000 out of the dead shark today, but I actually can make $10,000, and I'm saying the number to say the number, over the course of the year for each shark that I take people diving with. Um, we have an income of over 110 million US dollars per year on shark tourism alone. That does not include the people flying here, using the hotels, going to the restaurants, renting the car, renting a bike, buying a souvenir. That, that is outside. Simply people coming here to dive with sharks, $110 million for shark fishing, for example, shark and communication. As for jobs, uh, there are numerous programs. We always have to be very selective, pay attention. Um, some of them sometimes a little bit, I found, on the edge of uh, just taking your money and not providing anything back. So we are doing. And so see the result that they produce. Uh, citizen science could be people that can be scuba divers that collect data basis divers to be even outside of the water observers so that they can actually collect data and that is how the world and who is doing what where um, as for jobs well my job is in shark to be a scuba diving professional. I specialize in sharks and technical diving, and then I attach research and conservation to that job. So I expanded that uh, through uh, self-financing through my work. Uh, but there's other ways. Obviously, there's people that study, people that concentrate on a specific species. Um, 
photography, videographer, storytelling is another good one to bring awareness about the animals back to the surface, as well as uh, obviously the entire uh, marine biologist. But you don't really need to be a marine biologist per se. It could be somebody that wants to become a lawyer and all of a sudden decides to actually focus more on environmental law. So we need all the different aspects of, of our society to actually pitch in. Um, to the point of like doctor, after when the vaccine was developed for COVID, about the charts not direct shark hook removal we use the squalene that is lab produced we need to go out and have a so you can all help and pitch in finally um what is your best memory or experience with sharks and what is your takeaway message on this shark awareness day my best memory and my best time is uh, every time it repeats itself which is very often is when the shark the first shark came into my lap i was down there working with my mentor at the time the person that started all of this to whom under whom i uh, basically learned everything ben rose and i was working with the sharks and uh, this i kind of like wanted the shark to come in and then this girl just came in and kind of like hit me in the stomach and then stopped swimming and slowly slid down and we i was kneeling on the ocean floor and i had her a head on my on my lap i could feel her pumping the water through buccal pumping on my on my lap i could feel her weight and i could feel slowly just slowly relaxing right as her weight became uh, increasingly heavier they're not too heavy but you could really feel all the sudden point she just slumped down and that is the best memory to get better with the memory of each time it happens huge privilege to have a shark stays in this moment into your lap and allow you to pet me and i think it is i think my best thanks a lot for answering all of these I think you asked all the questions, that's it. If anyone has burning questions, now it's your time. I think we have a question. Yeah, I see that. Based on the sizes and types of folks you've removed, have you noticed that people are doing this intention question? Should we go? I'm going to do a follow-up if I just order your name uh, <laughs> the um the, um, the average size of the hooks that i deal with is more, more of a shark going clean or a scavenger so there are hooks that are accidentally in the because the shark went after um the hooks uh, actually questionable. So I was doing a film shoot with National Lots of Hooks that I have, and one of the guys on board says that those are not uh, accidental, that those are long line and hooks. So long lining is that those lines that goes over 40 kilometers long with all those fishing line with hooks on the bottom. And although it's forbidden in the Bahamas, we have long lining and drift nets forbidden, Again, enforcement of such an island nation is very hard. So some of the hooks are maybe more intense. 
dimensional. Now, like, like I said, you know, people, for example, that uh, into our country, we're 39 miles of, from Florida, uh, thrill of it, which is to me like the most abhorrent thing that we can do. If you fish to kill and eat because that is the only thing available that you have, by all means. But to fish for what I call, they call sport, make an animal, a creature fight for its own life and then release it just for your enjoyment. That is to me absolutely unacceptable. So some of the hooks is definitely targeted to the sharks. So it's a mix. And then Dine, Dine, three, what is microplastic? Well, some one who cleans their beach constantly. I take the dogs to the um, to a, a stretch of the beach. I have three big dogs, so usually what I do, we drive in a secluded part of the island and let the dogs, the eight of dogs. Um, we usually try to go to a local piece of abandoned beach where they just walk and swim and all of that. Every time we go, there's a lot of plastic. So uh, when you pick up the plastic that's been sitting under the Bahamian sun, it crumbles in your hands. Uh, sometimes into tiny, tiny little pieces. You go to pick up a bottle and it just crumbles and it creates a microplastic. Um, I would say it's very much... Uh, absolutely. If you want to talk about an epidemic, um, uh, a pandemic, there it is. It's plastic and microplastics in our ocean. That is the pandemic we need to address. Um, how does it affect sharks? Well, the big pieces do entanglements. I don't know how many turtles, dolphins, sharks. I actually removed, you know, fishing line, pieces of net wrapped around the pectoral fins, the dorsal fin, the, the, the flippers, the, 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 I mean, just countless. But the microplastic ends up into the sharks that through the food chain. So smaller fish eats the microplastic, bigger fish eats those, and then you actually end up having these massive amounts of microplastics distributed through the flesh of these animals. So, what are some innovative ways to support sustainable small-scale fisheries? Um, that is a very good question, Hafsa. I wish I had like a, a better knowledge. One of the best example that I found is actually in Alaska. Uh, there is, um, for the United States, there is a seasafefood.org that actually produces like a little card that you can refer to with green, uh, sustainable fish, yellow, questionable, and red, don't eat it because it's either non-sustainable or dangerous for you. And uh, um, Alaska seems to have found the correct way. And the correct way is rotation and seasonal. And the understanding, and then comes again to the consumer that not everything should be always constantly available. So they rotate their fishermen through a small scale, so only so many licenses, and also rotate them through different species throughout the year. So they have selection of air and says, okay, we're gonna fish a salmon here. We're gonna fish cod here. And then it's going to be kind of like switch. We're gonna fish a salmon here only this time of year and cod here. And so they seem to have found a more sustainable ways. But definitely is not a constant direct single target. Into. And so, as consumers, not always expect to have a very, very similar to my grandparents' strawberries in the winter in Italy. There were no strawberries in the winter because it was too cold. You also did not eat, um, I'm trying to think what is, a, uh, you know, like beautiful tomatoes. Uh, in the winter time, you ate cabbage and cauliflower because that's what is uh, grows into the winter time. So maybe go back a little bit to our, I, I know it sounds weird, but our old ways, you know, more in tune with the with the with the rotation of the earth, with the seasons, with what the terrain gives, and sometimes give it give it a break, right? Farming, we know that if we constantly farm, 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 that terrain is going to spoil. 
So it's the same concept. It's just like we need to go back to say, not this, not for the next three months. It's okay. There's other things that we can access. Uh, wow, there's a lot of questions coming in. So what is your opinion on aquarium trade of sharks like black tip reef and other small side species? Um, Rif Rifta, uh, yes, <sighs> tough question. So I do believe that aquariums have a high educational power. As a diver, as a woman diver, I actually do not realize that I am an absolute minority in this world. Um, as a diver, even, I'm an absolute minority in this world. Never mind, you know, like in scuba diving and even swimmer or snorkeler. Uh, I've traveled to different places. I've been invited to speak like in places like Singapore or um, I went to uh, China as well. Um, uh, Malaysia and the reality is 99% of the population does not have a physical nor financial access to what I do and so aquariums come in and they have this highly educational power uh, they bring the people underwater they uh, expose them to something that they would never be able to access in a different way so they do have a positive however not all aquariums like I don't believe in stark black and white. I think the world is 2,000 shades of colors and grays. Um, some aquariums might be not suitable. Maybe they have species that should not be in. The trade of animals from the wild into aquariums is something that worries me. But there's aquariums that figure it out ways to reproduce a small animals, a small sharks into their big habitat. So it's a, it's a tough path to reach masses of people that will never have any difference to be done. And so, for example, you don't know where the shark still love tiny dog fish or animals that can live in uh, habitats that are suitable to them. Do you have any experience on a shark attack? Um, I don't No, I don't. What is a shark attack? I mean, do my sharks accidentally bite me? Yes. Do I call a shark attack? No. Does my hundred and, you know, my 70 kilo dog steps on my toes and leans into me and bruises me? Yes. Does I call that as an attack? No. But I've, uh, I've counseled people that have suffered of, you know, injuries or from sharks. And usually I'll refer them to other people that have gone through that. But personally, no, I wouldn't say that I've experienced a shark attack. Uh, what is your advice for scuba divers when they first get to close with sharks? Well, that depends. That is the uh, million dollar question, right? I usually ask that question, uh, answer that questions with 10 more questions. Where are you? What kind of sharks? What are you doing? Um, uh, who are you with? So let's say you come and visit me in the Bahamas and we go in the water and I'll tell you, we will see these are sharks. There's the opportunity to see these other sharks. And then there may be a tiger shark show up where I didn't say there was a tiger shark. Well, you have me to refer to, to work with the animal and say, okay, we'll just keep an eye. In general, what I tell people is if you're in the water as a scuba diver and you see a shark, chances are you're okay. My suggestion would be to keep an eye on the animal, simply the same way you will keep an eye if an animal on land approaches you too close and is more of saying, hey, I see you, right? You can't, you can't ambush me, I just see you. So if a shark swims around me and swims behind me, move gently and slow and just have a quick look. Chances are the sharks will just swim by and swim away. More than ever, the sharks will actually not even swim by will see you turn around and actually swim away from you the other way that's the reason why shark tourism was born people wanted to see sharks and all this stuff and everything and if you have a camera and you're a diver i would say take pictures of that shark 
just, you know, just be mindful. Um, I would say a close look and keep an eye contact is, is the best way, right? And move nice and gently and slow. Uh, oh, okay, that's the same one, sorry. Right. Okay, so Christina. Far, the questions. Thanks again for joining with us. It's an honor to have you here today. Um, thanks a lot for Thank sharing you. your wonderful experiences. Um, I'm sure you would have inspired many to follow what you are doing and protect our sharks. You might see, like, you, you might even see some of us working with sharks in the near future. And <laughs> please Excellent. join us again in uh, our future events to share your invaluable knowledge among this little but curious and knowledge seeking community. Thank you so much for organizing such a wonderful meeting on Shark Awareness Day. You guys doing great work. This, this is the key. What you're doing is the key is talking, educating, speaking with each other, sharing the message. So well done. Thanks, Elaine. Um, that's a wrap Thank for today's you. session. Hope you found this very interesting. Um, learn new things and inspire to do more and chase your dreams. There will be a recording available on our YouTube channel. And if you like me through our Facebook and Instagram, and we